Mathematician is locked. Two people on mathematician is. Good morning, guys. How are you guys? Can you guys hear me? I don't know if you guys can hear me. Can you guys hear me? Okay, so I can go on teaching, right? Should I start now? Okay then, so today we'll be talking about love evidence. Yeah, today we'll be talking about love evidence. I hope you guys can hear me. I'm about to start the class. But before I start the class, I really need to get my cup of coffee. I, I, I need you people also to get your cup of coffee because we are going to have a one hour class. So, uh... I'm trying to look through the chats and see what you guys are saying, but I can barely say it. Okay. Okay, so yes, we're about to we're about to start the class, but please let me get my cup of coffee ready. Thank you guys.
Okay, guys, so I guess it's time to start. No. <clears throat> So I guess it's time to start now. Can you guys see me and can you hear me before I start? Because when I go, it's going to be on full gear. Can you guys see me and hear me? Can you see me and hear me? Can I move on now? Guys? Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, right now, I'm talking about uh, the types of evidence that we have. And um, like I said, if you, if you went through my, uh, my BC, I said that we have about 15, sorry, 10 types of evidence. Do you guys understand? We have about 10 types of evidence, and um, today we are going to be talking about the types and classification of evidence. Do you understand? So I'm trying to read. Okay, everybody's saying they can hear me, so I can move on now. So we are talking about the types and classification of evidence that we have. Do you guys understand? I hope you have your cup of coffee with you. And if this is your first time of coming to my channel, my name is Ola Yeni, dear Kolola Daniels. I'm a 500 level student, Faculty of Law, University of Lagos. And I started this so as to help those um, other people that are as well in 500 level and all that so that we can you know go through our work together do you guys understand so yes moving on now we are talking about the classes of evidence now the first type of evidence that i want to talk about today would be oral evidence so the question is what is oral evidence now before i move into the types of evidence that we have i want to be able to tell you about evidence in such a way that you can understand now the best way that you can understand uh someone said yeah okay the best way that you can understand evidence very well the best way you can understand every evidence very well is when you understand how it is either being presented in court or how to use it do you understand if you don't know how evidence is presented in court if you don't know what is the use of evidence in itself when you're in the court then it might be difficult to understand the classes of evidence not just that understand evidence itself as a cause now I made I made a particular video on what evidence is and it's in my uh, um, what is it called videos below like when you are done with class you can go look at the videos in uh, the other videos I have done do you understand I made what is evidence and the reason I made what is evidence is so that people can understand what evidence is today we are talking about the class of evidence so we are going to start with what is uh, um, what is it called. Yes, I want, to, I want to give you guys a case scenario, and that's going to be Miriam Sanders' case. Do you guys understand? If you people can remember very well, I made a video on Miriam Sanders' case as well. If you can understand very well the Miriam Sanders' case, you would know that Miriam Sanders killed her husband. Now, according to her, she said she didn't kill, but the court, the high court and the court of appeal said she killed her husband. Do you guys understand? So now, according to that case, I, I want to give you a brief fact. Because you guys are going to be the prosecution in this case, or well, I'm going to be the defense. Do you guys understand? So now, according to that case, um, Miriam Sanders saw naked pictures of a man, sorry, of a woman on her husband's phone, and that is um, Billy Amino Bello. Do you guys understand? I hope you guys are following me because I think the chat is quite quiet. Are you guys following what I'm saying? I don't know if you guys can put it on the chat that you guys can hear me or something. So yes, as I was saying, Miriam Sanders killed her husband because she saw naked pictures of a woman on her husband's phone. They've been having problems. Okay, you guys can hear me. They've been having problems with their marriage in the first place. And then because of that, okay, then thank you guys. Thank you guys. I can see messages that you can hear me. It's because we are following. That's why it's quiet. Oh, okay. Okay, no problem. Um, what's... Yes, we are jotting. Of course, we can. Oh, that's very good. That's very good. Okay, so let's let's move on. Now, Miriam Sanders killed her husband because she saw naked pictures of a woman on her husband's phone. Do you guys understand? Now, on the day that she killed her husband, there was another man in the house. That man was Ibrahim. Ibrahim is her husband's friend. Do you understand? Now, Ibrahim was trying to calm Miriam down because, you know, there was problem and all that. So, Ibrahim was trying to calm Miriam down. He was trying to tell her, chill, chill, chill. Do you guys understand? And then, he said that he removed knife 
from Miriam Sanders' hands four times. Do you understand? And Miriam Sanders kept charging at her husband, kept saying, No, I will kill you today. I will kill you, kill you, and all those and all those. Do you, do you guys understand? And then when Ibrahim was fed up, I think Ibrahim now left. I think he went to his own house. And then about an hour there, about later, he heard that uh, Biliamino Bello has been rushed to the hospital. Do you guys understand? Now, when they got to the hospital, the doctor that did the autopsy on Biliamino Bello said there were six, 12 different marks on his body before he died. Do you guys understand? Now, as the prosecution in this case, you are about to take the case to court. You want to prosecute Miriam Sanders for murder. What are the evidence that you are going to carry together and table before the court? That is the question. Do you understand? If you can understand types of evidence, then you understand the kind of evidence that you will table before the court. Do, do you people understand? So as the as the uh, um, uh, prosecution, can you people put it in the comment section for about one minute? Let me see your comment so that before we move on, because I want to know the kind of evidence you think would be relevant to the case in court. I I'm waiting for you guys. I'm waiting, guys. Time is going. Please be fast. Okay. Yetunde Bello said real evidence. Okay. What else? Drew Dola Femi Ajala said the witness statement. And then um, Busayo Salami said real evidence or oral evidence. And then Kozim said um, oral evidence by Ibrahim's friend. Okay. 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 Then Victory Obodo said documentary evidence. Okay. Okay, you guys, you guys are, you're actually getting it, yes. Uh, I like the person that said oral evidence. The person that said real evidence is also correct. And then uh, the witness statement, yes. Now, well, in court, it is better to have the witness testify orally than to have the witness give a statement. Because how then can you cross-examine? Don't worry, I would, I would get into all that. Now, let us start with the first one. And the first one here is oral evidence. Now, the first evidence that should be brought before the court is the, the, the oral evidence. The oral evidence of who? Of Ibrahim, of uh, Ibrahim. That is Biliaminu Bello's friend. You guys understand? Now, why did I say that that should be the first? Because we need somebody that will come and testify. You know that this is a case of murder. What are the two elements to murder? There must be an actus reus. You know what an actus reus is? That is the guilty act. There must be a proof that that person, that the prosecution must bring. The prosecution must bring a proof that um, Miriam Sanders killed the husband. There must be that proof. Do you guys understand? In the absence of any proof, then you cannot convict Miriam Sanders for murder. Do you understand? And in that particular case, there were only three people in the house. Bilaminu Belu, Miriam Sanders and the house girl. The house girl was not there to witness the crime. Do you guys understand? How then can the prosecution prove that the house, that it was uh, uh, Miriam Sanders that killed the husband? Because Miriam Sanders definitely will not testify that she killed the husband, will she? No now. No reasonable person would. If she would, she would have done that from the beginning. She would not have a defense lawyer. She could just plead guilty. So the fact that she has a defense lawyer is because she is saying that she wasn't the one that killed. Then how do we determine who killed? Do you guys understand? How then do we determine who killed? So, we have to bring... You know that the court is an independent party here. The court only has to listen. Do you understand? Now, the prosecution knows that it does not have evidence as to what transpired between Biliamino Bello and Miriam Sanders. Therefore, the prosecution is bringing Ibrahim to come and testify to Miriam Sanders' demeanor as at the time... He was in the house. He cannot uh, testify to what happened after he left. He can only testify to what happened when he was there. 
Do you understand? And when he was there, me, me, um, Sanders had not killed her husband. Therefore, there is no direct evidence. We will still get to that. There is no direct evidence as to, you know, how Miriam Sanders killed the husband. But at least there is an oral evidence. Oral evidence as to Miriam Sanders' demeanor as at the time of, uh, 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 as at the time Ibrahim was dead. So now, how then do you administer oral evidence in court? Another very important thing. Oral evidence can be administered through number one, examination in chief. Examination in chief. Number two, cross examination. And number three, re examination. Do you guys understand? When, um, when uh, Professor Amusa came to class, he gave us this while he was teaching classification and types of evidence. If you were in class, you would have, you would have, you would have seen it, definitely. Now, what is an examination in chief? You see, the prosecution in a, in a criminal matter or the plaintiff in a civil matter who brings a witness to court, when that witness is in the court, the witness enters the witness box and therefore you cross, you, give, you do what is called, administer what is called examination in chief, which means that is the point where you ask the witness certain questions that can bring out the fact of the case that you want as oral evidence. Do you guys understand? Now, for example, you are the prosecution lawyer, and then you are bringing Ibrahim. You carry Ibrahim, you put Ibrahim in the witness box. Do you guys understand? When Ibrahim is in the witness box, you then ask him, please can you introduce yourself to this court? My name is Ibrahim, whatever his son name is. And um, uh, then the next question you ask him, what happened on the 1st of January 2020? We are assuming that the 1st of January 2020 is the day that you know she killed the husband. So what happened on that day? Ibrahim then begins to spit out facts that happened on that day. The judge begins to write. The fact that the judge is writing what Ibrahim is saying, the judge is taking oral evidence into the court. Do you guys understand how oral evidence works now? The judge is taking what? Oral evidence into the court. And that oral evidence is will determine the case at the end because that person is going to be PW1, prosecution witness one. Do you guys understand? So, after oral evidence, you have cross-examination. Cross-examination is, is usually done by the defense lawyer. The defense or whoever, you know, the defense also, when the defense is opening his case, the defense also will bring his own witness and then administer examination in chief. Then prosecution too will cross-examine. Now, cross-examination is done to, to, to shake the credibility or the, real, the reliability of that particular witness. Do you guys understand? That is the essence of cross-examination. So if I am cross-examining Ibrahim, I am the defense lawyer, you are the one that brought Ibrahim to the stand, and I'm about to cross-examine Ibrahim. One of the few questions, this is quite easy, but one of the few questions I'll ask Ibrahim is how long have you known Miriam Sanders? For 10 years. Are you guys friends? No. Do you talk to her often? No. Okay. Are you her friend? No. Okay. Do you like her? If he says that he necessarily does not like her or something of that sort, then it taints its own evidence because it means that there's a tendency that whatever he's saying is born out of his hatred for her. Although on the stand, he might not say that he hates her, but that's, the, that's what we lawyers are supposed to do. Ask certain questions that will bring, um, you know, fact for him that can shake his credibility. Do you guys understand? I'm just trying to let you know how, how the court system works, how um, evidence works and all that. Do you, do you guys understand what I'm saying? So you have an examination in chief, the person that administers the, a witness. is the one that is bringing the witness. It's, therefore, is the one that is asking the witness question. Cross-examination is the person that is trying to you know, counter the reliability of that witness. And then re-examination is brought by the same um, person. That person that brought the witness will then re-examine his witness in any case that the other party, the other party's cross-examination has shaken his re, uh, the re, rela, reliability. Do you guys understand? So if um, me now, I cross-examine the witness and I was able to puncture the credibility of that witness by saying that the witness does not like my clients, you will come up and then ask certain questions that will go against that particular thing. Do you understand? I watched, <coughs> I watched a particular movie. I'm trying to explain this thing very well. I watched a particular movie where uh, uh, somebody was, somebody was, you know, um, 
administering an examination in chief. She witnessed, she was wearing a niqab. She was wearing a niqab. You know what a niqab is as a Muslim? She was wearing full hijab and wearing a niqab. Now, she witnessed a particular uh, incident in the night. And that incident was a case of murder. So she was an eyewitness who came to court to give oral evidence. Now, while she was giving her oral evidence, you know, that's the examination in chief. She said she saw them and all that. Now, you know what the, cross, the person that cross-examined? You know what the person said? The person just came and then the person asked the question. Um, you, how, many, how, how many years have you been wearing the cab? And then she said that she has been wearing the cab she's, since she was born. And I said, okay, what about your whole Jalami and all that? She said, yes, she has been wearing it since she was born. Then she, he asked her, do you know that when you wear that whole thing everywhere you go, you are depriving your body of vitamin D? Do you understand? You know, vitamin D is a very good um, um, nutrient for the eye. Do you understand? And then she said, oh, she does not know that because she's not an expert on that field, so she cannot answer it. Then now asked her another question. Do you have eye problems? And then she said, yes, you know, you cannot lie on the stand. So he now asked her another question. So if you have eye problem and this particular thing happened in the night, how are we sure that this person, the accused here, is that person that you actually saw? Do you understand? Because he was trying to puncture the reliability of the eye statement, of the eyewitness by her statements. Now, he was trying to show that because of the lack of vitamin D that she has in her body, because she wears hijab and niqab all the time, then it has affected her eyes. And if it has affected her eyes, how then could she, can, or how then can she testify to the fact that she saw those two people at, at night? Do you guys understand? So that's how cross-examination works in court. Now, in the re-examination, you know what the lawyer did in the re-examination? The lawyer stood up. And then, instead of him to start asking questions, he just said, he just told the, the, the what is it called? One of the officers at the back. He told one of the officers at the back, raise up any finger. And the guy raised up three fingers. Three fingers. And then he, he told her, how many fingers can you see? And he said three. Then after the court, if, he, if, if she could see that, then she can see anything. Do you guys understand? That is how you have examination in chief, cross-examination, and re-examination in a court. Do you understand? Now, do note that before we can call evidence, um, before we can call evidence, oral evidence, that person must be sworn. If the person is not sworn, then whatever the person say cannot be determined as oral evidence. So, I was watching a particular video. I wish I can, you know, put it up for you guys to watch, but I don't think... I can share my screen right now. I'm so sorry. So I was watching a particular video by a rapist and an arm robber. And then the person was saying in the video, while the journalists were, were interviewing him, he said, I've killed a lot of people. I have raped a lot of people. I have this blah, 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 a lot of people. Now, the question is, the testimony, when he was saying it, if I'm, if I'm to defend him tomorrow, and the prosecution brings up that testimony, can I object to the testimony that it is not oral evidence? Why? Because it, he was not sworn before he said it. Yes. But I cannot, um, uh, uh, I cannot um, object if they are trying to admit it as a video evidence. Do you, do you understand? I can object on another ground, but I can't object on the fact that he was not sworn. For oral evidence, the person has to be sworn before the things that come after the person's, the things that comes, you know, uh, after the person has been sworn, anything that the person says then becomes oral evidence. So oral evidence does not just happen in court. Oral evidence also happens in the locus inco. What is the locus inco? Locus inco. Locus inco is the place of the action. Please, one minute. Locus inco is the place of the action. That is the place that the cause of action arose. Now, in the case of Miriam Sanders' case, uh, the cause of action arose in their house. Now imagine that the judge, the judge is saying, ah, I don't understand. Because Ibrahim is saying A, Miriam Sanders is saying B, I want to go to this place that this thing happened. I want to go and check what exactly happened there. Then the judge will adjourn the case. The next proceeding is going to be at the house. Then the judge will be there. We now swear in Miriam Sanders. Oh yeah, Miriam Sanders, talk. How did the thing happen? Now, the next proceeding, the oral testimony is, is being given in the locus inco. The locus inco is the place where the action arose. Do you guys understand? Please give me one minute.
yeah, I'm trying to get my notes so that I don't, you know, uh, go out of what I'm supposed to teach. So yes, the locus inco is the place where the action arose. And you can find this, oral evidence is in section 125 of the Evidence Act. I hope I got that correctly. Yes, you can get to section 125 on the Evidence Act. If you get to section 125 on the Evidence Act, you can see oral evidence. It defines oral evidence as... Um, you know, whatever it is. And then we should also look at section 176 of the Evidence Act. Section 176 of the Evidence Act. What does section 176 of the Evidence Act says? It says that where you have an incapacitated person, any body language that is given by that person or sign language is going to amount to oral uh, evidence. Do you understand? So, sign language by a person or body language by a person will amount to oral evidence. That can be found in section 176 of the Evidence Act. So, let us move on to another type of evidence that we have, which is documentary evidence. Documentary evidence. Now, according to section evidence, section 285 sub 1 of EA, according to section 285 sub 1, now, it defines what a document is. Do you guys understand? It tells us that a document can be a map, a book, a graph, a drawing, a photograph, whatever it is. So when you are in court and you are about to tender a document in the, the, the into evidence, then that is going to be documentary evidence. How do you tender a court? A, sorry, how do you tender a document into the court? As a lawyer, where the document is undisputed, this one is a trial whatever it is it's not under evidence so but i'm just trying to let you understand when the document is undisputed the lawyer can tender it from the bar to the court but most times a document is usually tendered when a witness is in the witness box so if for example uh, for example you are uh, you are a prosecution to a particular uh, uh, murder case do you understand okay for example miriam sanders you know after miriam sanders Prosecute, uh, the prosecution lawyer brings Ibrahim. They also have to bring the IPO. The IPO also has to tell us what he discovered while he was investigating it. So while the IPO is talking, now anything that the IPO brings that is a document becomes documentary evidence. Do you guys understand? So for example, if they are about to bring the death certificate of Biliami Nobelo, because obviously you must prove section 125, oh, sorry, 258. I'm very, very sorry. I saw, oh, 258. Not 285. I'm very, very, very sorry. Section 285 sub 1. So, now, I was talking about Billy Bellum and I was talking about um, the, the prosecution. If the prosecution is going to bring another... Uh, yeah, it's 258. I'm very sorry. If the prosecution is going to bring another party, let us say that the prosecution is bringing the IPO to the stand. Now, if the IPO is going to tender the death certificate, I'm just giving an example. Now, you are going to say that, oh, can you recognize this death certificate? Yes, I can recognize it, blah, blah, blah. And then he tenders it to the court. That death certificate becomes a documentary evidence before the court. Do you guys understand? The death certificate becomes a documentary evidence. Kindly correct it. Yes, I am very, very sorry. I have corrected it. So, I hope you guys understand that. So, let us go to another type of evidence that we have. And a very important type of evidence that we have, it is, it is, I think it is locus in co by the judge. I, I didn't understand that. Please, if you can say that again. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's, I think it's visit locus in co by the judge. I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Okay, so let us move on. Let us move on what we're talking about. Now, let us go to direct evidence. Direct evidence. So what is direct evidence? Direct evidence is a, it is oral evidence. Direct evidence is oral evidence plus facts in issue equals direct evidence. Do you guys understand? And direct evidence can be found in section 126 of EA, of the Evidence Act. So now, when you're talking about direct evidence, what do we mean? Do you guys understand? What do we mean by direct evidence? Direct evidence is oral evidence. Uh, Adela Kunjon, I don't understand. You said no. Why did you say that? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I still don't understand what's going on. 
Okay, so let us continue. Direct evidence is oral evidence plus fact issue. What does that mean? Direct evidence is oral evidence plus fact in issue. What does that mean? Please, if you don't understand something, write out your question in full so that I'll be able to know what your question is. Do you understand? So if you're saying, I don't understand a particular thing, I've said so many things, I don't know which one of them you don't understand. So write out your question in full. Oh, okay. I'm going to, I'm still trying to teach what direct evidence is. I've not taught it yet. I've not taught what direct evidence it is yet. So I'm still teaching it. Okay, so what is oral evidence? I've already told you what oral evidence is. For you to have oral evidence, the person must have been sworn. And then after the person is sworn, anything that comes out of the person's mouth, because oral evidence is given by the person who saw and who heard. Do you understand? So Ibrahim can only testify to what he saw and what he heard. Do you guys understand? Now, when you are giving oral evidence, you are saying what you saw. And then if what you saw is in relation to a fact in issue, that then becomes a direct evidence. Do you understand? What are facts in issues? Facts in issues are... What are facts in issues? Facts in issues are uh, basically... Uh, what, what, what's that? Um, you know that in every murder case, you must bring somebody that allegedly killed. Now, the question is whether or not that person, for example, in Miriam Sanders' case, whether or not Miriam Sanders stabbed Billy Aminu Bello. That is a fact in issue. Do you guys understand? Did, did Miriam Sanders stab Billy Aminu Bello? It is a fact in issue. Why is it a fact? Because if, we, if that is not determined, if that issue is not determined, then Miriam Sanders cannot be convicted. It becomes a fact in issue. Do you understand? Now, whether or not Miriam Sanders intended to cause grievous bodily harm on Billy Aminu Bello, if you have done criminal law, then you know that um, the mens rea for murder is not intention to kill, but intention to cause grievous bodily harm. Do you guys understand? So the question is, whether or not Miriam Sanders intended to kill Biliamino Bello, sorry, intended to cause grievous bodily harm on Biliamino Bello, which is the menstrual, and whether or not Miriam Sanders actually stabbed Biliamino Bello. So what can we say? Did she stab him? That's the question. That's the fact in issue. Did she stab him? Whether or not Miriam Sanders stabbed him. Now, if you can have oral evidence that can speak to her stabbing him, then that is a direct evidence. Do you understand? Now, in this case, there is no oral evidence that can speak to the stabbing. Most times, a direct evidence is usually somebody who witnessed that particular thing happen. Nobody witnessed Miriam Sanders stabbing Billy Amino Bello. Do you guys understand? So let us give an example of the Lekki Gate. Now, in Lekki Gate, for example, we saw like, um, we saw the toll gates, we saw um, 20, 20th of October last year, we saw when the military men decided to perform wonders, or according to what they said, they were shooting in the sky, but miraculously, the bullets from the sky came down to hit a lot of people. I was not there. Abby, I'm presuming that you were not there. And therefore, we cannot give evidence, a direct evidence, because we cannot speak as to the fact in issue. The fact in issue is, did the military men directly shoot at citizens in the Lekki Gate? That's the question. That's the fact in issue. Did they? Can I speak, can I give oral evidence to that? I can't. Because for you to have oral evidence, you have to be the person that saw and the person that heard. Do you understand? So I cannot give oral evidence to it. You cannot give oral evidence to it. So therefore, whatever we are going to say can never be a direct evidence. We can only say, I saw in a video. I cannot say, I saw it happen. Do you understand? So if you are saying, I saw it in a video, then what you should tell that is the video, not the me. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So, in, a, in when you are discussing direct evidence, direct evidence is oral evidence plus fact in issue equals. So, all those people that were at Lekki Gate, they are the only ones that can give a direct evidence as to what happened. Do you guys understand? That is number one. Now, number two, we have three cases here. We have the case of Idiok versus the state, Hamed versus the state. Idiok versus the state and Ahmed versus the state. Now, in those two cases, the court held that where a direct evidence is believed by the court, where a direct evidence is believed by the court, then the, if the court believes it, then it has proven a fact in issue. 
Do you guys understand? Once the court can believe what a person says that he saw or that he heard relating to a fact in issue, if it is believed, then that fact in issue is deemed as, that fact in issue rather, is deemed as being proved. Do you understand? Once a person can say, oh, I saw this, and the court believes it, you know that when the witness comes to the witness box, the court has to look at the demeanor of the witness, has to look at the countenance of the witness when the witness is giving his testimony. Do you understand? So if the court can believe what the witness is saying, then it is deemed that a fact in issue has been proved. Do you guys understand? That is number one. And then the next one is also the case of legal remembrance versus goose. And in that case, the court held uh, that uh, fact in, uh, sorry, a, a direct evidence is also known as um, a direct evidence is also known as positive evidence, and then as opposed to indirect or circumstantial evidence, which is the next thing that we are going into now. Because for indirect or circumstantial evidence, it is by logic. Do you understand? For direct evidence, it is by the court believing. Once the court can believe that what this person is saying is true, then uh, someone commented, please state the cases again. Oh, the cases, the case of idiot, idiot versus the states, idiot versus the states, Ahmed versus the states, and legal remembrance, legal remembrance versus goose. Those are the three cases that you find under uh, um, direct evidence. So I'm trying to make this as idiot, yes, idiot versus state. I'm trying to make this as simplistic as possible so that people can totally understand what, um, what I'm talking about because I want everybody to follow. I want everybody to totally understand this. It's going to be my joy if we all do understand. So, um, sorry, I'm trying to put the camera better here i think this is good okay a minute please so we are moving into the next type of evidence that we have and next type of evidence we have is indirect or circumstantial evidence indirect or circumstantial indirect or circumstantial evidence so what do we what what is indirect or circumstantial evidence what does it mean? When we say indirect or circumstantial evidence, what does it mean? Now, in a case where you don't have direct evidence that can speak to the fact in issue, you don't have an oral evidence that can speak to the fact in issue to give you a direct evidence, then the court will have to use what is called as a logical inference. That inference must be logical. The court has to use a logical inference and not just that, the court would also have to be cogent when it is giving such logical inference and such facts and has to be reasonable and unequivocal when it is, you know, basing its judgment on such facts for you to have what is known as um, indirect or circumstantial evidence. Now, before, before we go on, let, let me try to give you the, um, the case of, uh, um, sorry, one minute. Okay, so before we go on, let me try to give you the case of um, uh, 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 Miriam Sanders. Now, you are the prosecution in that case, and it is obvious that you cannot bring a direct evidence. Can you? Can we? No. Why? Because there is, no, there is nobody that can testify as to what happened inside the room, apart from Miriam Sanders. Miriam Sanders is the only person that can tell us what happened. And definitely, Miriam Sanders is trying to protect her interests. So therefore, the fact that we have to bring before the court... Although we cannot speak directly to the fact in issue as to whether or not Miriam Sanders stabbed her husband because nobody was there and we cannot have a direct evidence. But we can bring other evidence that if looked at collectively, we can determine, um, a, 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 we can determine that Miriam Sanders killed her husband. Okay, what am I saying? Let me give you the fact. Now, I have brought, I have brought um, IPO. I, uh, sorry, I brought uh, Ibrahim. Ibrahim have come to the court. And Ibrahim came to the court to tell us that he removed knife from Miriam Sanders' hands four times. He removed knife from Miriam Sanders' hands four times. Okay. Now, he, he also told us that Miriam Sanders was very vicious and angry because of what her husband did. Abi? Okay. Now, 
we, are, we have gotten that fact. Let us put that fact in one hand. We listen to him. We might not necessarily believe Ibrahim. We are the judges in this case. But now the prosecution has come to prove that these two things. And that was an hour before Ibrahim uh, um, was rushed to the hospital. Do you understand? Now we've carried that fact. We have put it here. Okay, we now continue listening. The prosecution brought another person. He brought the IPO. The IPO testified to the fact that when they got to the house, the shisha bottle that was broken was not where the blood was. Do you guys understand? That the blood has been mopped and cleaned from certain areas. Do you guys understand? Okay, we carry that fact again. We put it in another hand a bit. So we have two facts. The one of Ibrahim, the one of the policeman. Now we now get to the third one. And the third one is the, is the one of the medical doctor. What did the medical doctor say? She said that there were stabbed wounds. Twelve. Twelve stabbed wounds on his body. Do you understand? Good. Now we have three. On one, on one hand. And then... When a defense was going to this box, what was Miriam Zana say? I could not have killed my husband. I loved him so much. Although we have misunderstanding. But kinika, 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 and all that, and all that. Okay, madam, we have heard you. So how did your husband die? Eh, he was strangling me. And then my baby was crying. So I wanted to go and meet my baby. And that was when I now pushed him. So when I pushed him, he now fell on the broken shisha bottle that was already on the floor. Really? You know, the court, we have to sit down and listen to it and say, really? Now, to you, which one of them is going to sound believable? One minute. I have a question. Can't there be oral evidence and it's not direct? You made it seem like all oral evidence... You made it seem like all oral evidence are direct. No, not all oral evidence are direct. Before I continue what I was saying, not all oral evidence are direct. Oral evidence can only, I told you that we have oral evidence and then we have direct evidence. For you to have direct evidence, then you must have oral evidence in a fact in issue. That's what I was saying. That for you to have oral, if I come to court and I say, ah, my name is Ola Enidia Kolola Daniels, that's an oral evidence. But is it a direct evidence? How is it direct? How does my name affect the fact in issue? Do you understand? So, oh, I work at a... Uh, uh, blah 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 blah. How does that affect the fact in issue? No, it doesn't. What the fact in issue is whether or not a person has been killed. So if you tell us your name, it does not affect the fact in issue. If you tell us where you work, it does not affect the fact in issue. If you tell us you have five children, it does not affect the fact in issue. Do you understand? So that whatever you are saying is an oral evidence, but it can only be a direct evidence when you affect the fact in issue. Do you understand that? So, let us move on now. So, I was talking about uh, circumstantial evidence. So, now, you see, what, when the court was convicting Miriam Sanders, the reason the court convicted was because of one thing. Who last saw the husband alive and can give us a cogent fact as to how he died? It's Miriam Sanders. And what Miriam Sanders has come to say is not believable. Because according to Ibrahim, whose testimony is the most important in this case, and also the medical doctor. He said that he removed knife from her hand four times, which means she was already vicious enough. Which means that he was already vicious enough. Do you guys understand? He was vicious. Sorry, she was vicious. Do you understand? And then we also have um, 12 wounds. Yes, not all oral evidence given speaks to the fact in issue. Yeah. Okay, good. So, which means that he was vicious, Sorry, she was vicious, and that is a, 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 an evidence that is in court. And then we have a, a, a medical that said 12. So now, we, when we are applying the last sin principle, the person that can give us a reasonable explanation as to the death of Benjamin Bello has to be who? The wife. And then what the wife gave was not reasonable. Therefore, the conviction stands. So you would see that the, what was the basis for the conviction in court was basically circumstantial. The basis for the conviction was circumstantial. But that circumstantial was reasonable. Do you understand? The circumstantial evidence that was that was the basis for the conviction was reasonable. When I was listening to the fan talk, the son rather, the son talk, and then the son that was defending Miriam Sanders, and then he was saying that he was appealing the case to the Supreme Court because uh, Miriam Sanders, uh, what, what did he even say? Uh, he said that the prosecution has not proven the case beyond reasonable doubt. How? He said the real evidence. Now let us before before I move on, let me go to number five. Real evidence. He said the real evidence 
in that case was not tendered. Who can tell me what the real evidence is before I continue? Put it in the witness in the I say witness box. In the comment section. What is the real evidence in the case? I'm waiting for you guys. What is the real evidence in the case? My own video is not showing the board straight. What did I do? Sorry about that. The knife. Yes, the knife. Uh, I don't think I positioned this tripod in such a way that the board can be straight anyway. Let me see. I don't know. Sorry. The knife. Yes, the knife. The knife in the case is the real evidence. The knife in the case is the real evidence. So according to the prosecution, yes, the knife. According to the prosecution, uh, sorry, the defense, that's the son. The son was saying, oh, there was no real evidence. And in the absence of real evidence, in the absence of the instrument that was used as a murder weapon, then you cannot have a conviction. I was watching How to Get Away with Mother. If you guys watched How to Get Away with Mother, if you can remember the first episode, that's the season one, episode one, you would know that there was this... Um, uh, another thing that Annalise Keating usually give uh, her students, any student that impressed her, she gives her, them that, um, I don't know, that lady justice or something, and then says that with that thing you can get out of any exam and still get an A in the course and all that. You know that was what was used to Kim's, kill Sa Sam Keating. Now, in that particular case, those students took the murder weapon from the house and then they wanted to bury it because there was a Supreme Court case in the case of Commonwealth versus Deloitte in America, which is still extant. That says that the Supreme Court threw out that case. The prosecution did not prove its case beyond reasonable doubt because there was absence of murder weapon. Do you understand? If the prosecution cannot prove showing the murder weapon, then you know, they have not proven their case beyond them. I think that was the logic that this guy, this guy was trying to use here. Knife use, yes. They had, I think that's the logic that this guy was trying to use here. But the court here is, is more reasonable. The court said, like, like. And then another thing that he was trying to say is that there was no DNA evidence. That if there was no knife that can prove the stabbing, then there can be no DNA evidence. But logically speaking, this knife that we are talking about, can will you kill somebody and leave the knife there? Uh uh. When you know that you want to run away from the mother, will you kill the person that leave the knife? Let us let us be truthful. Will you? Nobody will now. You will throw the knife away. So will the prosecution have to start looking for knife, knife, you bone knife, you bone knife, knife. Nobody's nobody at that time. If the fact is cogent enough, then it can apply. Do, do, do you guys understand? Now they said there was no DNA evidence, there was no knife, and so they are appealing the case to the Supreme Court. I am very sure the Supreme Court is still going to affirm the judgment. It is not like I personally like death penalty. I'm not saying that they should kill Miriam Sanders and all that. I personally feel that she has two children, and those two children just, just, just lost their father. It is going to be unfair on them to kill the mother as well. At least just... Give the mother life imprisonment. Let her stay in prison for life. At least, at least that should be like a, a detriment to the other people killing and all that. Give the mother life imprisonment. But her children should be able to at least see her so that they can also know that they have... Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Hello? Please, if you can hear me, put it in the comment section. I want to be very sure that I can. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, yes, we can now. Okay, so now, as I was saying, I, I am not a fan of, I am not a fan of death penalty. I'm not saying that they should kill her or something like that. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, you know, they should put her in prison. But on this fact, I am using this fact to teach. So it's not like I am against Miriam Sanders or something like that. I cannot tell what happened. But according to what has been proved, you know the court is not the court of truth. I'm very sure as, as year five students, we should know this by now. The court is not the court of truth. The court is the court of proof and facts. So it is what can be proved in court that the court concerns itself with. The court cannot then you know, start inquiring on every case, what's the truth, what's the truth, what's the truth. No, it's what is provable that the court can, can concern itself with. Do you, do you understand? So, now, moving on. So, in this case, like we have decided, we've discussed here, real evidence is the, uh, is, the, is the instrument itself that has been used to either 
cue or whatever it is. That's instrument itself. So, for example, in this case, the real evidence there is the knife. Do you guys understand? In other cases, you know, the real evidence can be gone or whatever they are. You know, according to my notes, the real evidence concerned concerns the tendering of material objects like guns, etc., weapons of offense, items carrying blood stain or fingerprints as an item of forensic value. So, real evidence most times are usually items of forensic value. But let us go back to circumstantial evidence. I have uh, how many cases? There are about um, four cases in, uh, in, in, in uh, circumstantial evidence. We have the case of... Um, we have the case of Adepetu versus the states. We have the case of Adepetu versus the states. Adepetu versus the states. We have the case of uh, Peter Ego versus the states. Peter Ego versus the states. We have the case of Arichi versus the states. Arichi versus the states. We have the case of Ahmed versus the state as well. We have the case of Ahmed versus the state. So we have about four cases. Do you understand? We have Peter Igo versus the state. We have Adepetu versus the state and Arichi. In Adepetu versus the state, in Adepetu versus the state, what did the court say? The court said that the houseboy, you know what the houseboy did? The houseboy carried the madam, went to go and throw the madam, the madam into a lagoon. The madamo we did not see. The houseboy now. What the last place that they saw the houseboy and the madam was at that lagoon side. I think as at the time they decided the case, they did not know where the madam was. Now they convicted that boy of murder because they could not find. I think they only found the dead body of the madam. Yes, I can remember now. They found the dead body of the madam. Do you understand? I think she drowned in the lagoon. So the person that was the last to see this bad person, that is the boy, was convicted on the principle of last sin. Do you understand? That's the How did this person, did this person just jump into the lagoon? That, those are the questions that we need to know. Do you understand? Yes, that Peter Ego. Yes, did this person jump into the lagoon? How did this person die? So, then I used to ask questions about, you know, all those boys that used to tell girls to come over. Girls, come over, come over. Imagine that you actually invite a person to come over into your house and then the person dies on your bed. Just imagine. How do you explain to police that you are not the person that killed? That uh, maybe that person died of food poisoning or something. And then, the, uh, let's say the person ate rice before the person came and then the person died, the, the person died of food poisoning out of the rice the person ate. And then the person came to your house too and I ate rice. And then when the night did the autopsy, the poison was found in rice, but they cannot distinguish. They cannot distinguish which rice caused the death. You are done, because I don't even know how to explain. I don't know that they are going to dream. That don't let, let, let you understand. You know the last same thing. Although you you are saying ah, I was not the one that did it. Jesus Christ, come and help me. But according to the autopsy, the food poisoning was in the rice. She ate rice before she came, but they cannot distinguish which rice poisoned her. Do you understand? So now you, as the person who last saw her, have to explain how she died. Do you understand? So also in the case of Arichi versus the state, in the case of Arichi versus the state, the last in principle, sorry, Peter Ego versus the state rather, in the case of Peter Ego versus the state, the last in principle was also used to convict the accused in this case. Uh, because he was the last person that saw him. I think in this case, the victim's body was not found. And the accused was the last person who saw him. And also, we have the case of uh, Arichi versus the state. I like what the court said in Arichi versus the state. And I want us to learn it together. Now, the court held, uh, um, someone said something. But my question here is, since there is no DNA evidence at the court, can't it be, can't it be gotten straight? I'm sorry. Can't it be... Uh, can't it be gotten straight away from the victim by the doctor who... Uh, okay, I'm going to explain that, but let me finish what I'm saying here. Now, the court, however, stated that to support a conviction, the circumstantial evidence must not only be cogent, be complete and unequivocal, but compelling, compelling to, to the... To, sorry, compelling and lead to the irresistible conclusion that the accused and no one else 
is the murderer. Let us apply this principle that it must be what? It must be it must be cogent, complete, and unequivocal. Abi? And must be complaining to lead to the irresistible conclusion that the accused and no other person was the if in that Miriam Sanders case there is evidence that shows that there was a third party who entered the house, probably the third party is an arm robber or a thief or something, then we can say, Oh, this logic no longer makes sense. Because although we have we have a a a testimony by Ibrahim, and that testimony is saying that Miriam was angry and he removed her from Miriam's hand four times. Although we have that that particular uh, uh, testimony, but there was arm robber that entered into the house. Therefore, we cannot determine if it is Miriam that actually killed or the arm robber. We then need a murder weapon that can say that oh, it was Miriam and not the arm robber. But who else was in the house? Who else? Nobody apart from these people. That's me. I'm saying that's a male and Billy I'm in the bedroom. Then what else could have happened? How else can we determine who the murderer is? How else? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, is there any other person that could have been the murderer? That's the question that we can ask. Is there any other person? We have fact a table before the court, and then the court cannot find any other person that could have been the murderer. And the accused is also the last scene with the person who cannot tender a cogent excuse as to the death of the person, then that, the accused is likely to go in for murder. Do you guys understand? So we have the case of Ahmed versus the state, Adek Petu versus the state, Peter Igo versus the state, and Arichi versus the state. I hope you guys have, uh, I hope you guys understand this up to this extent. Yes, if you have any question, please put it in the comment section below before I continue. I'm about to go to primary and secondary evidence. Please put it in the comment section. I'm listening. Is there any question? If there's no any question, please just say no question so that I can continue. Is there any question? Okay, no question. Okay. No question. No question. Okay, let's let's continue to primary evidence. Now it's number six, primary evidence. Number six is primary evidence, and that can be found in section eight six of evidence act. So then what then is primary evidence? Now, when you look at section 86 of Evidence Act, you see that document, primary evidence are usually documents. You see that document that is the original. Yeah, well explained, sir. Go on. Okay. In oral evidence, you mentioned three components. Oral evidence, can you explain the, can I explain the what? Um, Jane, please, what do you want me to explain? Because you said I explained three components. Yes. When you are in court, I explained those three things. Yeah, um, you said, can I explain the words? I didn't get what you said I should explain. Do you understand? Okay, so I'm moving, I'm moving on. I will be waiting for your question. So now, for primary evidence, you are talking about that document that is the most original. The second one. Oh, cross-examination. Okay, I'll, I'll go back to that. Please remind me before I leave so that I can finish. I want to round this up on time so that any questions, I'll answer them before we move on. So, for oral evidence, for primary evidence, we are talking about that document. That is the that is original, like the most original. Please one minute. <sighs> Thank you. So we are talking about that document that is the most original. What about hearsay evidence? Yes, I will talk about hearsay evidence. I will definitely. So we are talking about that document that is the most original. So for example, if there's a contract between me and you. And then I append my signature. You know, I will definitely append it with, with uh, a biro. I append my signature with a biro. Do you understand? That one with that biro is the primary document. Then probably say something that has happened to the primary document. Then you now have to photocopy or something. Then that photocopy, which is known as the facsimile. I don't know how to pronounce this thing, but I usually pronounce it as facsimile. Yeah facsimile or the photocopy of that document so when i have a facsimile of a document which means which is i have a photocopy that photocopy is the secondary evidence do you understand then number seven we have secondary evidence and then secondary evidence can be found in section 87 of the evidence act 
Section 87 of the Evidence Act, you have secondary evidence for primary evidence, Section 86. Primary evidence is usually known as the best evidence rule. Why do we call it the best evidence rule? Because it's on its own. You know that for secondary evidence, there is usually this doubt as to the originality of the documents. Do you understand? Is this document actually true? Is it is it true? You know, in I can I can I can the um, the code. I can have a replica of a document. Then I include. Let's say we had an agreement. I can include certain terms in that agreement. After we've had our original document, I will include certain terms. Then I'll make a photocopy of it. So you will be looking at that photocopy because the photocopy is not the original. So if you are looking at the photocopy, you are like, okay, this is the original, but it is not the original. Do you, do you guys understand? If I am a dubious person. And then we had an agreement that had about 52 uh, terms. We had an agreement. Okay, you don't understand. Okay. If I am a dubious person and then we had an, agree uh, an agreement that had 52 terms. Do you understand? In those 52 terms, you have I, 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 under each, for example, so term number one. Uh, you should do this. I, if this happens, I, I, if this does not happen, then number two, you shouldn't do this. Do you understand? Now, in, in inside those terms, I went to amend. When, where I said you should not, I remove not. Do you understand? So, what you now have is you should do. You know, it is you should not do. I remove not. And then when I went to photocopy that one, again, and I brought that one to the courts. Now, as a secondary evidence, because it is not the original document that was signed, as a secondary evidence to the courts, Okay, so as a secondary evidence to the court, the court, as the other lawyer in the case, you know, if I was the one that is the dubious lawyer and then I'm coming to the court, you are the other lawyer, you are supposed to object to that document because that document is not the original. So according to the case of Lucas versus Williams, Lord Escher in Lucas versus Williams, the only time you can admit a secondary evidence is where there has been a good and a reasonable reason given to the, to the loss of the primary evidence. Do you guys understand? That, that's why I, usually, I said that there is a, there is, let me write it down, Lord Escher, Lord Escher in Lucas versus Williams. Yeah, so now, when I was talking about primary evidence, I said it's usually known as the BER, best evidence rule, because when you, when you put a primary evidence, the court usually attaches so much weight in the primary evidence. Do you guys understand? The, usual, the court attaches so much weight. Why? Because the court sees it as the real evidence, not, but not weapon. No. I mean, like, the real thing. Do you guys understand? No, when you talk about real evidence, you're talking about weapon, knife, fingerprint, whatever it is. So, it's seeing that primary evidence as the original document. While the secondary evidence, not necessarily fake, but it doesn't attach so much of a weight in its decision when dealing with secondary evidence. However, that best evidence rule has been abolished. You know, it was stated in the case of Garten versus Hunter, Garten versus Hunter by Lord Denning. Lord Denning. I hope you guys can see what I wrote here. I don't know if you can see it. Please, with all this video be available on your page later? I hope so. I, yes, I, I feel, I think they would be available. I think they would be available. Okay, so moving on. So as I was saying, now, Secondary evidence, I already told you. So let me read what Lord Escher said. He said, primary evidence is evidence which the law requires to be given first. Then, secondary evidence is evidence which may be given in the absence of that better evidence, which is primary evidence, when a proper examination of its absence has been given. Do you understand? So, also, in the case of Jacob versus Attorney General of Aquaibom, that's for primary evidence. In the case of Jacob versus ba Attorney General of Aquaibom, the court held that the production of the original document or any proof of an, ad of the, of an admission of its content by the party against whom is tendered is known as uh, primary document. So we are talking about the original document. That is what the primary, uh, um, um, the primary evidence is. When you are tendering the original document in court, look at section 86. But when you are tendering a facsimile of that document, a photocopy of the document, a replica of the document, then that's secondary evidence. That's section 87. Do you understand? Although there used to be a best evidence rule where the court attaches so much weight on the primary evidence, but theoretically the court still does it. But, you know, 
uh, sorry, practically, the court still does it. But in theory, like in your book, they'll tell you, oh, it doesn't apply again. But practically, when you tender an original document, the court looks at that original document with so much weight than when you tender a, 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 a facsimile. Do you guys understand? So I have, I've spoken about how many types of evidence now. I've spoken about seven types of evidence. Let me look at the question box. Yeah. Uh, so somebody asked, I'm sorry. Somebody asked, uh, what about public documents? Sorry, one minute. Um, what about public documents are not, sorry. What about public documents that are not lost but can be given? Will it be primary evidence? Yes, now, if a public document is not lost and the original document can be given, then that's the primary evidence. But when you are giving a facsimile of that, there are some public documents that will not be even be taken to the court. Like, the court will not accept it as evidence. The court will go and tell you to go and get the CTC of that document. That is the certified true copy of the document. Do you understand? Before it can be admissible and all that. So let us move on to material or vital evidence. Number eight, we have material or vital evidence. So there are some evidence that when tendered, yeah, uh, when it can't be given, given it is a public document, sorry, what about public document that are not lost but can't be given? Oh, that are not lost but can't be given. Will it be called primary evidence? What when it can't be given because it's a public document? Oh, what do you mean by can't be given? Is it that they cannot issue it from the registry or something? Because I, I don't know. For Let, let us give C of O, for example. A C of O is a public document, Abby. A public document, when it is the original one, then it's a primary document. Do you understand? But you can, when your C of O is lost, uh, you can get a CTC of that document and then still tender it before the court. So I don't know what you mean by public document that can't be given. If you can give me an example, then I can, I can see if I will, I will be able to answer the question. So let's move on to the next one. The next one is... Um, the next one is... Uh, what was it called? Uh, material evidence. So, what exactly would we determine? A minute, please. So, what exactly would we determine as material evidence? Material evidence, basically, is that evidence that is very, very important. It is so important that if you do not tender that evidence, either a person speaking, or a document, or a real evidence. If you don't tender it before the court, then it can, it can, you know, decide whether your, your, your case will fail or succeed. That is a material or vital evidence, which can be a witness or a document. Dear court, please check time. Okay, I am, I'm about to finish. Don't worry. I'm about to finish. I'm very, very sorry for taking your time. Yes, I will, I will end this class before 75. I can see that it is 68. So I'll end it before 75. Don't worry. So... Now, we're talking about material evidence. Material evidence basically has to do with that evidence that is so important. It is so important that if you take it away from your case, your case would either fail. No, if you take it away from your case, then it will fail. Do you understand? But if you put it in your case, then it will succeed. Do you guys understand? I'm trying to let you understand how material evidence is. So, if we look at the case of Ikemsin versus the state. Ikemsin. Ikemsin versus the state. The court held in Inkemsi versus the state that the material evidence is that evidence which on its logical nexus with the issue tends to influence decisively the establishment of the fact in issue. Now imagine the testimony of the doctor that said that there were 12 stab wounds. That is the material evidence. Because without that testimony that of the stab wounds, then the logical inference of how Miriam Sanders would have stabbed her husband where we are bringing it from Ibrahim who said that he removed a knife and from the doctor who said that there are 12 stab wounds. You know that that's the next source for the conviction. Someone said I removed Naira from her hand. Someone said there were 12 stab wounds. When you connect that you can say oh Miriam something must have happened here since there is no other thing outside it. So the testimony of the doctor is 
a very material evidence like very important material evidence yes let me see what you are saying i'm sorry uh uh what if the primary evidence was faked and brought to the court can it be detected in kemsi versus the state hope is correct no s-o-n not s-i s-o-n when a, a prime material evidence is fake can you have a fake material evidence that's why as a lawyer you're supposed to be ready for any objection when the person is about to tender a material a, a a primary evidence you tell the court objection my lord i would like to look through that document before it enters the court so you have to scrutinize the document in fact a part cannot bring a document to court without having given you first so you must have looked at it you must have known first do you understand that's how court works you don't just enter the court and say you want to tender evidence you have to give the other lawyer the other lawyer has to look through it and then determine whether or not that document to enter the court or you object on certain things do you guys understand? So I was talking about material evidence, and I was telling you that when you're talking about material evidence, according to Income Sin versus the State, they are very vital and they are very, very important. Let us also look at the case of um, NAS Limited versus UBA, where the court held that if a party fails to tender evidence, which is material to his case, such party will be presumed to be withholding such evidence. And also in the case of Kuti versus Alasha, the court held that if such evidence, if such failure leads to the collapse of your is or a case, then he would be blamed. He would have himself to be blamed. That's the case of Kuti versus Alasha. And the case of Dogo versus the state, the court held that the vital witness is a witness whose evidence may determine a case one way or the other. And also we have the case of Ochiba versus the state, the state where the court held that a person who knows something significant about a case is a vital witness. Who knows something significant. So we have the case of Ochiba versus the state where NES versus N N A S Limited versus U B A, N A S Limited versus U B A, Kuti versus Alasha, Dogo versus the State, and Ochiba versus the State. So you have Ochiba versus the State, Kuti versus Alasha, and the rest. So they are saying that for you to have a vital or material witness, that material witness must have known something vital about the case, something significant about the case. If an eyewitness to a murder case is there, you didn't bring the eyewitness and you want to succeed in that murder case, how is that possible? Do you guys understand? So those are, yes, Ochiba versus the state. Yes, uh, those are the very important things we need to look at. So we have two more to go. We have hearsay evidence and credible evidence. Number nine, hearsay evidence. Hearsay evidence. So the question then becomes, what are hearsay evidence? Please give me one minute. I'm trying to lubricate my truth. The question is, is what are yes evidence? Yes evidence are those evidence that you heard someone say. Do you understand? They are not evidence that you saw. They are not evidence that you witnessed or that you heard. But you heard someone say. That's why they are hear say. Do you understand? You hear someone, then you said it. Do you, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Those are hearsay evidence. And that can be seen under section, um, section, sorry, one minute. Uh, I'm trying to look for my hearsay evidence. What section is it? I'm very, 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 very sorry. Uh, material evidence, oral evidence, documentary evidence. Yes, section 87. Section 87. Section 87 and the case of FRN versus Usman. Section 87, the case of FRN versus Usman. The court held that yes, the evidence are known as secondary evidence. Sorry, secondhand evidence, rather. Section 87. Eight, sorry, 37, rather. 37, yes. Section 87 is um, secondary evidence. So it's section 37. I'm very, very sorry. Yes, section 37. And then the court held in section... I have 30 seconds to go. I guess you guys... I'm pleading with you guys to give me an extension. Because I'm trying to be fast. But I don't want to be so fast that I would... Um, section 87 is secondary evidence. Section 86 is primary evidence. I don't want to be so fast that I would uh, take away certain certain things. So please, permit me to 80. By 80, I should round up. Okay, so um, in yes evidence, section 37, the court held... Uh, sorry, in FRN versus um, Usman, the court held that secondary evidence, uh, uh, sorry, hearsay evidence are known as secondhand evidence or derivative or transmitted evidence. 
Also, in the case of Ojo versus Baruru and Okpala versus the state, the court held that when you are talking about hearsay evidence, then you are talking about evidence that somebody had. And, you know, those evidence are not in their self admissible. Hearsay evidence are not in their self admissible, uh, although there are certain exceptions to it. And we're going to be talking about those exceptions when we get to that particular evidence, that particular type of type, um, evidence as a topic. When we are treating it as a topic, I can't treat it today. It's just for you to understand what hearsay evidence are. So, for example, you are the prosecution in a case, and then the defense has come. They brought somebody, and then that person is saying, and then he said, and then he said. Once you start hearing, and then he said, you object. Because it is hearsay. You are saying what he said. Do you understand? When somebody is in the witness box and the person is talking, and you're hearing, and then he said, and then she, uh, she said, and then it is hearsay because you cannot tell us what that person said. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? You only have to tell us what you hear, except that person was saying it to you. Do you understand? If that person, for example, now in that Lucky Gates uh, account, now somebody came to meet me and then narrated the whole story of what happened in Lucky Gate. I cannot go to court and sit down in the witness box and begin to narrate what the person said about Lucky Gate. Everything I am saying is hearsay because I hear him say. Do you understand? The reason for hearsay evidence not being admissible is because human beings, imagine when you are gisting with your friends. Human beings like to exaggerate. If you are gisting with your friends and your friends are telling you about something, for example, do you understand what I'm saying? And you've heard it. When you want to say it to a third party, you must add your own data. You will add Magi, you will add salt on top of it. But this is a court of law. Court of law cannot be entertaining matters where somebody is adding Magi and adding salt. That's the reason yes, yes, evidence cannot be determined, cannot be admissible, rather. And then secondly, because the court has to look at the demeanor of the party that is giving that statement. And also, if, if I am coming to give you yes, yes, a statement, do you understand? So a person came to tell me about what happened in Lucky Gate, and I'm coming to relate to you. Hmm? You cannot cross-examine me on what that person said. Because I, all I'll be saying is, ah, no be me talk am, na him talk am. Now I ain't talk So why am I here? Do you understand? But if I am giving ASC evidence, you can't cross-examine me on the ASC evidence. Oh, they said the police shot up. Uh, uh, the person told me that the police shot directly. So now, you as a lawyer for the police, you are not cross-examining me as to how the police shot. Am I the one that saw how the police shot? How can I determine? How can I tell you? Do you understand? So we are supposed to cross-examine the person that saw. Do you guys understand? So that is how ESA evidence works. ESA evidence are inadmissible. There are certain times that ESA evidence would be admissible, but we are going to be treating it as a topic on its own. I just want you to understand how ESA evidence works. You can find in Section 37 of Evidence Act in the case of Ojo versus Bururu, the case of FRN versus Usman, and in the case of Okpala versus the state. And then the last one for today would be credible evidence finally we are almost done the last one for today is credible evidence what are credible evidence credible evidence basically is is the integrity of the witness that is talking or the integrity of the document that you are bringing so but most times it is used for the witness do you understand so when you are coming to meet me for okay if i am supposed to cross-examine an ipo for example an IPO is investigating police officer on the case. So I'm cross-examining the officer. And then I am able, during my cross-examination, I am able to show either that I brought a particular evidence from somewhere, let's say a voice recording, where that particular officer was asking for bribe from somebody. And then I brought it while I was cross-examining the officer. Officer, will you tell me, can you tell this court that you are a honest person in everything that you have done so far? And he said, yes, I'm very honest. I'm a believing Christian. I go to church every Sunday. I pray, I fast. Okay. So do you want to say it as to a fact in this court that you have never asked for, either directly or indirectly, and you have never collected bribe? And then he says, no, I have never asked for and I've never collected bribe. You say, my Lord, client, the uh, counsel would like to cross-examine this uh, uh, witness with a particular 
um, voice notes and I also like to adduce it before this court as evidence. And then the court says, okay, proceed. Then I bring the particular voice note and then I place it before the court. And then I say, uh, IPO Adisa, can you remember this voice? Does it sound like your voice? You would definitely want to deny it. And then I show the video. And then, see, does, that, does that look like you? And then in that video, you can see him asking for bribe and all that. Now, I am able to puncture the integrity of that particular witness. That witness cannot be determined as a credible witness to give testimony because he collects bribe and all those things and all those things. Do you guys understand? I, I'm like, trying to let you understand how credible witnesses work in court. So in the case of Agbi versus Oge, in the case of Agbi, Agbi versus Oge, the, the court tells that credible witness is that that is worth of belief. And for evidence to be worthy of belief and credible, it must not only proceed from a credible sense, it must be uh, credible in its entire circumstance. You understand? And the phrase credible witness also means witness that is natural, reasonable, and probable in the view of the entire circumstances of the case. You have the case of AMC versus Volkswagen Limited. And it is settled law that a party must prove its case by adducing credible evidence before the burden placed on him by the law can shift to the opponent. And that's the case of Eyo versus Onoha. So when you're talking about credible evidence, it is not enough that you bring evidence before the court. Your evidence must be such that it is credible. It must be such that it is reasonable. So Ibrahim, in the case of Miriam Sanders, brought before the court, he is a credible witness because, first of all, I don't think that he, he, he would have lied or something like that. But if the other party can show that he has lied in any of his statements, then it removes the credibility. So you have to bring somebody that in all the circumstances when put together or a document, in all the circumstances can be regarded as a credible evidence or a credible witness. Do you understand? And I quoted about uh, three cases for that. Agbi versus Oge, AMC versus Volkswagen, and Ayo versus Onoha. So I hope... Does anybody have any question? Because we are about to end the class. Does anybody have any question so far? Does anybody have any question? Does anybody have any question? Okay, so in the absence of any question, I will see you guys perfectly understood. None from here. Okay, so everything perfectly understood. Brilliant students. I will see you guys in the evening on Sensei app where we can discuss more. I've been trying to look through the past questions and I don't think I've been able to see any question or clarification of evidence so far. If you have any or you have seen any question, please put it on the Sensei app so that we can have a very beautiful and brilliant discussion. Thank you guys for having this class this morning. Please, can I get your contact? It's not really a question. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. I'll put my co contact in the live uh, in the in the comment section after this live thank you so i am going to see you guys tomorrow guess what we're having tomorrow we're having company law but it's going to be in the afternoon not in the morning it cannot be in the morning because i have to go to church and i presume you have to go to church too so in the afternoon when i get back from church we are going to talk about forms of businesses we are going to talk about sole proprietorship as well as partnership so you guys should go and read ahead so that we can have a fun discussion and talk about company law tomorrow so i'll see you guys i love you all thank you for being here bye bye